I, I just do my art and I really avoid talking about it. Therefore, I had this really good idea to start my presentation to you with a real performance. I had the plan to dress up as an RNA strand with four rings of foam around my body representing the four nucleotides, the building blocks of life. And this construction would have been covered with a thin layer of fabric um, to disguise my human body shape. Dressed like that, I was planning to come crawling down the stairs slowly, slowly onto the stage and there you would have seen a whole field of electrical plates with pots of hot water boiling on them and this kind of hot vapor rising up through clay tubes. This would have been the reenactment of the origin of life in a nutshell and at the same time it would have been a good introduction into the kind of art that I'm doing. But because of time limitation, evolution takes much longer than 18 minutes, I decided to do something else and show you a previous performance. It is called White Unknown Entity and I've done it in 2012 dressed up as a white amoeba, crawling over a very narrow balcony in an empty sake fa um, factory in Japan. This work sums up a lot of key, key elements of my work. First of all, I really like processes far more than finished and perfect products at the end. Also, I'm really interested in movement, in change and in transformation. In fact, I'm wondering what, what is behind this transformation? What kind of power is it? And this is the main issue of my work. It has been given many different names in different cultures. Chi in China, or Bata in India, or Prana in India, sorry, or the Elan Vital, as Henri Berson, the French philosopher, once called it. I gave it another name. I had my own word for it. I called it the swelling force, or the Schwellkraft. And for this swelling force, I started one of my first bigger installations here in Munich back in 2004. I established my own institute in this empty shop which I could use and it was called the Institute for Herbristics and the Empirical Sciences of Swelling Bodies. In this institute I started an ongoing investigation into the swelling force. Over the course of two months I was growing all kinds of things, ordinary mushrooms, plants, mold, bacteria, I suppose, and also fake um, organisms, which I was thinking about and building on over the weeks. So at the end, this whole space was completely covered with structures and they grew onto the glass front and after that, they even conquered the city space, grew onto other buildings and I don't know how far they got, but the essence of this piece and of this work was that I got really interested in this kind of uncontrollable force of nature. And the reason for this interest lies really in my upbringing and in my past. Because I come from a family of scientists. Also, I went to a scientific um, grammar school and I grew up in Germany in the 70s and the 80s where the idea of progress was closely linked to scientific discovery and technolo technological growth. Um, the idea that um, only things that could be measured and proved have full authority. Nature was there to be enhanced, um, perfected, even exploited, just as our bodies and minds. And I think that this kind of mindset prevails up until today. So as an artist, whose understanding of the world is expressed through intuition, sensuality, hands-on experiments with matter and the knowledge of the body, my way of looking at the world was very different and I felt sometimes inferior. I started to rebel against this. So, therefore, I created many works where organisms ran riot, completely out of control and anarchic. I found beauty in the imperfect, so-called ugly, and I admired slime, quicksand and swamps, or epidemic infestations of buildings. So, when I got invited to hand in a proposal for the new art prize 2 zu 1 here in Munich, which is an interdisciplinary prize, where an artist has to team up with somebody from a completely different profession, I realized that this was a chance to challenge my own prejudice. I had worked with other artists from other disciplines before a lot. I really like collaboration, so I worked with sound artists, poets, composers, but I never really worked with a scientist. I always had this idea, but I pushed it away. So this prize was the chance to jump into this completely new experience and to get out of my artistic comfort zone and to challenge my way of looking at the world, basically. 
So, I was lucky to find Professor Dieter Braun. He's professor for system biophysics at the LMU here in Munich, and he's researching exactly my topic from a scientific point of view. He wants to know how life started on the early Earth. How did life originate on the early Earth? What we try to do in the lab is recreate the conditions of the early Earth. Volcanic rock pours, try to understand how temperature gradients bring the first one, two, three molecules together to form longer strands, to put in information and to start Darwinian evolution. While this is very interesting, whether we can make it in the lab, get evolution going, it's also important to state that we will only be able to say it could have happened that way. It, that could have been a scenario. And essentially, we will never be able to know how it really happened on the early Earth. So now you met him too, which is good. You have seen the next, the second part to me in this project. And what he just said now was something that I found really exciting because he said that he's not able to prove his hypothesis about the start of life on Earth. And even though it's one of the biggest questions of humanity, it's not possible to prove it. And this really showed me that there is actually a quite big common ground of uncertainty where Dieter and I met. And so it wasn't so easy for me to write up a proposal for our joint work. It's, it was a project plan that I handed in, and it's also an se experimental setup because I chose one artist, one scientist, throw them into the lab for one and a half years in a dialogue, and at the end we had this plan that some kind of installation or object would sum up all of our research. But we didn't define what it would be, so it was completely open what happened. So the first um, conversations we had in his lab were really nice because I saw that his lab was actually just as chaotic as my studio and I felt immediately at home there. Also, I began to read all about his subject, talk to him, try to understand the origin of life and then afterwards I tried to understand the history of science, read books about objectivity, about philosophy and then I ended up with spiritual questions and I got really confused and stressed because I couldn't imagine how I put all these vast things into one object or one installation. At the same time, I started also with my practical work, with the hands-on things, and one thing I always do is look at ordinary objects, and I, therefore I looked into the bin of Dieter's lab, and there I found in the trash a broken disc. Dieter explained to me that this disc is actually the base of one of his ma main experiments about thermodynamic unequilibrium. So um, I took this disc home into my studio and started gluing it on a paper, drawing along the cracks and the lines and the fragments, and then all these kind of ideas came pouring out, and I also put them onto the paper. At the end, I made a photograph to document all that, and when I looked at the photograph later on, I suddenly saw my own distorted and quite grotesque face in this reflection, and I had to laugh, but at the same time, it was also amazing because I realized that this was a self-portrait of myself in the middle of the process of this project. I realized that whatever I will cre create will deal only with a tiny, tiny fragment of the subject. It was like finding single pieces of a giant puzzle without ever getting the bigger picture together. And in a way, this brought me back to my own and normal way of working, which is sometimes quite chaotic and also not linear. You have to know that in my work, I'm, I'm, when I'm interested in something, I'm just jumping into a stream of experiments and I'm myself often quite surprised by the outcome. In fact, it's really the fun of, of being an artist, to not know what you get out in the end. Um, and the inspiration for my work can come from anything. It can be conversation, it can be music, it can be a radio, it can be also just an object. So, um, for me, what's really important in my art is more a kind of awareness of the process I'm in and that I can stop the process at a moment when I'm feeling I'm touching onto something that really expresses what I want to say. And so this frozen moment is, is what I'm showing you. It's like this piece. It's just by chance that I got this photograph. But in, in a way, it sums up what I want to say really beautifully. It's just by, well, it was luck, really. So. Um, the main thing about my work is that it's about a certain state of mind and not really about perfect and refined craftsmanship. Also, what 
became clear to me was that I didn't really want to illustrate Dieter's research. I didn't want to take photographs of his lab or something like that. I really wanted to understand what he's doing as far as I could and then translate it back into my own artistic language. By doing that, I wanted to build a bridge between his world and mine. So, after all this, I was really relaxed because I felt, okay, now I know what I want to do and how I want to do it. It was like a weight was coming off my shoulders. And I was going into the flow, and the first thing I, thing I did was um, a piece I call Urknallbrille, or the Big Bang glasses. And the good thing about these glasses is that when you put them on, you are actually right in the moment of the Big Bang. And you can witness everything. And because you are there in the right moment, you are also able to prove and to see how first life on the early Earth started. So that's a good starting point also for the project. And after that, I asked myself the second question, which is, which is actually, how did biological life really begin on Earth? So I already showed you the sketch. It's about thermodynamics. That's at least what Dieter Braun told me. And I created this kind of volcanic um, setup with the hot water coming through a clay tube. And after this, when the heat comes into the system, the nucleotides get together to form the first RNA strand. This is a simple model of an RNA strand by using ping pong balls and pins. So, after I have this RNA strand, I was starting to think about the principle of a helix or a double helix. How are they organized? I stumbled across a um, plastic comb in my studio, which I had left over from an earlier project with a composer. And by twisting this comb and adding a little light, I suddenly could create a kind of poetic demonstration of a double helix. And this is also an example of how I sometimes use ordinary objects and change them, twist them, to fit them in, into some completely different context and touch upon other questions. So, now, after life emerges, evolution starts immediately. I was inspired by the way RNA or DNA sequences replicate. It's a doubling of information that has been compared to the principle of zippers opening up and the loose ends being completed again by a new pair of zippers. And that's the way um, information gets passed on. So I created this floating big organism out of zippers, which looks like a plant, but at the same time reflects the ongoing process of information that gets passed on. Okay, so now evolution has started, but what happened from then on? Dieter showed me the tree of life, the phylogenetic tree, and he, um, which is a branching diagram showing the evolutionary relationships among various biological species. So what you see there is a model which has at the, at the center, that's the origin of life more or less, and then it branches out in all the different species. I found it really interesting, and when Dieter after that told me that the origin of life is like a black box, like a mystery where life just jumps out and you don't know why, the idea of a safe came into my mind. But this safe has the tree of life as a dial on the front. Humanity tries to crack the code and unveil the secret, but probably that will be never possible. In the end, we still don't know how we emerged, and surely we don't know why, but we do know that our bodies are made of up to 97% from elements that derive from the core of stars and faraway galaxies. One day, I was lying in my house on the sofa, just reclining, as suddenly a ray of sunlight came into the window, highlighted these dust particles, and this sight connected me suddenly to the universe. So, after two years, more or less, I was able to showcase these and many more works in an exhibition at the White Box here in Munich. Our dialogue has been really fruitful for me. A lot of ideas have sparked up in a kind of feedback spiral between the scientist and me. Also, Dieter Braun told me that he gained a lot by explaining the sometimes very complex issues of his work to an interested and curious layperson. He had new ideas how to bring his subject across to somebody who's not from the, uh, from the scientific community. We both agreed that in science, just as in art, it's really important to get our subjects out into society for discussion. For me, 
the whole work with Dieter Braun was something else. I overcame some of my prejudices, and I realized that science itself constantly generates new questions which prompt the scientists to get on a really uncertain journey too. I start, started to wonder that maybe we as humans as a whole, or at least in our Western societies, are longing for certainty and predictability to get rid of the lurking fear of illness, of death, or under un other un unforeseen dangers of life. And therefore, we willingly hand over the responsibilities for our bodies and also for our world and the nature we live in into the hands of experts. Of course, it's possible that scientists sometimes play a quite active role in keeping up the illusion of security and control. It also became clear to me that the scientific knowledge on which our worldview is based is much more fluid and fragile than I usually assumed before. I did another self-portrait. This time there were no fragments and no cracks, but a holographic impression like the multifaceted eye of an insect. I thought that the strict separation and opposition of science and art is maybe just a concept and just a question of perception, and now I have replaced my concept with a multidimensional view. Science and art are much closer at their core than I thought. And it was science that brought me to that insight. Thank you. <laughs>